All right, so if everyone can please take their seats, we're going to go ahead. So welcome everyone to the California Nanosystems Institute and the uh, final presentations for Nanoscience Labs Session B. Uh, my name is Dr. Rita Blake. I am the manager of education here at the California Nanosystems Institute. And we have a special guest who uh, is going to give us all some welcoming remarks, our executive director of CNSI, Sonia Luna. So please give her a nice round of applause. Rita's been telling me all about uh, the things that you've been learning this week uh, with regards to not only doing uh, work uh, on experiments, but also in communicating science and how you would go about expanding everyone's broader knowledge of all the science you're learning. I think it's really important that as you move through your science career, and we all hope you pursue science careers, that um, you keep in mind that they, uh, communicating what you know, what you've learned, what you can appreciate, what you can explain, is really important to others. So when I first came here almost three years ago, um, I was not a scientist. I had done some lab work, but it was mathematical modeling, so uh, that kind of doesn't count. Um, so um, as I started to learn more about nanoscience and the intersection of all of the different scientific disciplines, chemistry, physics, engineering, medicine, um, I had a lot to learn. And I'm really appreciative of all of the um, faculty, scientists, and researchers who helped me learn. And the skill that they had, despite the fact that they were super, super, super smart, and they know all of the, the science, uh, the technical aspects of, of how all of these things uh, work, um, they were always able to communicate the basic science to me in a way that I could understand it. So I think that that is a really important aspect if you decide to go into a scientific career that you appreciate that you, one of the big things you can do for a society is be able to communicate in an understandable way what um, your science is all about. So we appreciate that you've been here all week. I hope you had a good time. And on with the presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So again, for uh, friends, family, guests, uh, welcome to the California Nanosystems Institute. Uh, just to give you guys some context as to where you are, because you may have never heard of us up until your sons and daughters applied to this program. Uh, we are not a department in the traditional sense of an academic department. We don't grant degrees at CNSI, but what we do is we bring in researchers from all over the campus. So we're in the center of what is called at UCLA the Court of Sciences, meaning that all of the sciences are surrounding us. So we've got uh, medicine, life sciences, physical sciences, engineering, uh, even computer science, um, all of whom have a faculty that come here to do research on nanoscience and nanotechnology, which is science and technology at the nanoscale, AKA very, 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 very small. And all of your students will be able to tell you exactly how small, I'm very sure, um, by now after very five, uh, five very rigorous days of, of scientific work. So there are a lot of people that work to make this program run, so there are some thanks that I have to give before we fully get started. Um, so as far as the leadership team goes, there is myself, but there's also um, very critically our uh, program director and instructor of record, uh, Professor Sarah Tolbert, who's a professor in the Department of Chemistry and the Department of Material Science and Engineering and also a researcher here at CNSI. Um, she is really uh, the additional creative driving force behind all of this work. Um, and she was also the first uh, person to teach your, all of your students this week, um, giving them all a, a basic introduction to nanoscience and nanotechnology. Also, uh, Dr. Elaine Morita, who is our program coordinator, uh, was also, again, extremely instrumental in getting all of this 
were coordinated because as you'll see when I show you the schedule, there's a lot of moving parts that happen in this program and things don't come together without a big team behind them. And Elaine is, for me, the, the, the critical person on my team that helps. So Elaine, thank you very much. There's also a lot of staff behind the scenes, some of whom our students have seen, some of whom are really more behind the scenes. Um, Annika, our student work study, was extremely helpful in getting all of our uh, uh, experimental materials organized, and students did experiments throughout the week, so it was a lot of stuff. Um, Jeremy, our events coordinator, and Kevin, our events manager, really helped with scheduling, catering, all of those incidental things that are you know, still extremely important for things to run. Uh, Mark, who is our digital media producer, who helps make things visually lovely for us and also is helping us have this event live streamed. So to people who are watching us on the internet, hello. <laughs> and thank you, Mark, for making that happen. Uh, and also Lucas Lee in AV and IT and Nikki, our uh, special projects director. Thank you to you guys as well. And also, I didn't get a chance to thank them because there's too many of them to put in photos, but all of our instructors for this program are also the key people um, who are all graduate students in various divisions of physical sciences, life sciences, and engineering, are all pros at all of the experiments that your students got to do, and we're really the, the, the hands-on people working with, working with them over the week to teach them all of the new materials and all the skills that they learned. So thank you to all of the instructors. Um, and actually, I'm gonna ask everyone to, to give them an extra thank you by way of a round of applause, because they did a lot of work. <laughs> and some of whom I see are already starting to arrive here and will also be asking you questions. So, <laughs> so I hope you were nice to them. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, so, so it's, it's a lot of work that these students did with basically two goals in mind that, uh, that Sonia mentioned when she gave her introduction. One of which, obviously, is to expose students to more advanced topics in nanoscience. Most people don't even hear about the word nanoscience or nanotechnology before they get into the later stages of college. I mean, I certainly didn't when I was in high school. I had no idea what it was. I knew what an iPod nano was, and that's about it. And that doesn't even really exist that much anymore. So it's a pretty unknown word. So even just learning what the word is is one step, but obviously, having a deep understanding of why nanotechnology is so important was the other, because all nano is is a, is a scale or a size. So why that size has its own field of science dedicated to it is something that we really wanted students to deeply understand over the course of the week. And the other goal for this program uh, was to develop skills in science literacy and also, very critically, science communication. Because it's one thing to be able to know the science, it's another thing to be able to really thoroughly and well communicate the science. And that's, that can be a much more difficult challenge. So if you were wondering what your students were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, if they haven't been calling you and texting you already, telling you what was going on, this is basically our schedule for the week. So every day they had an experiment that they did in the morning, teaching them some unique aspect or application of nanoscience. And then in the afternoons, they would have a guest speaker that would give them a deeper dive into one specific area of that more general experiment that they did in the morning. And then the afternoons uh, further augmented what they learned by giving them some more uh, visual demonstrations or hands-on activities or uh, challenging problem sets that would help them help probe their understanding of the material. Um, so it was. It was very, very packed every day. And then in the evenings, the other thing that they had to do, which is what you will be seeing, the products of today, is that they had a homework assignment where they were challenged to explain the experiment, not in the traditional sense by writing a lab report, but by drawing a picture. And not a picture literally of the experiment, but a picture that is a metaphor and shows an analogy of the experiment to try to explain it in a way that doesn't use any terminology or any of the very literal like microscopic or nanoscopic visuals that you might see. And as they'll probably tell you and maybe slightly complain to you afterwards, this is a very, very challenging task. It is really not easy to make a metaphor that is interesting and universally understandable by people, even people who are like our instructors and our graders who know the experiment very well. 
it is a very challenging task, and I'm sure at some points it probably drove our students a little crazy, but they really rose to the occasion and they really worked hard. And some of the some of the drawings you will be seeing uh, today, which were so, which were some of the ones we thought were fun and interesting to to highlight to all of you, and so. All of our students were uh, put into groups of three and one group of two in this case since we had 32 students this year. And they were given a drawing by a student that was not in their group. And just by looking at the drawing, they had to figure out what experiment that drawing is actually trying to uh, get across and what are the key aspects of the experiment that that drawing is highlighting. So. It's reasonably challenging. I mean, it's more challenging, I think, to draw, but even interpreting can be a little bit of a challenge, but I'm pretty confident that all the students are gonna, are gonna ace this, so I'm very excited. And actually, uh, parents, friends, and family, uh, we're gonna count on you for this presentation as well, because you guys are, are our key audience for this, because this is meant to explain to you guys the experiment in ways, again, that don't use any terminology or any jargon whatsoever. So I am counting on every single parent in this audience to ask a question. If you don't understand something, or if you do know the science and you want to ask a scientific question, by all means, please ask that as well. But you guys are the key audience for this, so I expect every parent to ask at least one question. And I think the rule is that if, if you don't ask a question, you don't get to eat food at the reception. So ask questions, I will be watching. And um, instructors and myself, uh, we will also ask questions. Students, please also um, ask questions. We want this to be an engaging and active session. So uh, with all of that said, um, I'm going to bring up our first team. So that would be Kelly, Katie, and Hikaru, and let's give them a round of applause. Ladies, just so you know, you have a laser pointer, so you can, uh, the button's here, so you can point to things if you would like, so you don't have to walk over. And there's three mics for the three of you guys. Please speak into the mic so that people can hear you, especially for the live stream. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Katie Kayan. I'm Kelly Sue. I'm Hikaru Kotake. And we will be um, explaining this illustration which um, relates to the biotoxicity experiment we did earlier this week. As you can see, there are several robbers, all varying in different sizes, right, like right here. Um, and these sizes are dependent on their weight, so this guy is like the lightest, so he's the smallest, medium and largest, right? Uh, so the first robber is capable of going through the window and is able to steal the TV so window and TV, and from the house. The middle-sized robber is able to go through the front door um, and is able to steal a lot more stuff than the first robber. The last robber decides to go through the chimney, which he, isn't, he doesn't fit through and can't steal anything. So the second portion of the photo shows a police officer arriving to the scene of the house and dictating what has happened to the house. Um, since the first robber did not steal much from the house, the police officer believes that he can handle the issue on his own. Whereas since the second robber stole a lot from the house, the police officer decides that he needs backup. Um, and since the third robber didn't steal anything, he just leaves it as, as is. So for our experiment, we basically use different forms of silver in order to kill yeast cells. And this was our way of measuring the toxicity of the silver. So the three different forms that we used were silver ions, um, silver nanoparticles, and silver powder. So in this drawing, you can see that the first robber, which it weighs 120 pounds and is the lightest, represents the ions, which are the smallest. The second robber represents the nanoparticles, and the third robber, which is the biggest in weight, um, represents the silver powder. And so all three forms of this silver, they damage the, cell, the yeast cells in the same way by destroying the membrane of these cells, and they do so by making the hydrophobic part of this membrane, which is the water-hating part, into a hydrophilic part or a water-loving part. And in doing so, this destroys the membrane by breaking it apart. 
And so all three of these forms of silver, they get into the cell in different ways. So the first robber, which is the ions, he gets in through the window. And because ions are charged, they have to go through active transport and get in through the ion channels. And in this case, the window acts as those ion channels. The second robber, or the nanoparticles, um, because the nanoparticles are very small and they're neutral, they're able to be taken directly into the cell through endocytosis, which you can think of as the cell basically gulping up the um, nanoparticles. And so in this case, the robber goes in directly through the door without any difficulty. And the third robber, which is the largest, um, this represents the powder. And because the powder is so big, it can't get into the cell directly. And as a result, only some of these ions can get in. And you can see that the robber can only fit in some of its parts through the chimney. And um, also, in our experiment, we measured the health of these cells um, by seeing how much carbon dioxide they produce through cellular respiration. And this was our form of seeing whether they were alive or not. And this is shown in the illustration in the bottom half of the picture, where the illustrator tried to show how the police would respond to the damage done by the cells. And as you can see, the nanoparticle, which does the most damage, um, responds, the police responds in the most serious way by calling for backup. So one of the limitations of the key points missed in this illustration was the ratio of the robber's weight. In actuality, the ratio of the different forms of silver are massively different, while the jarring has the robber's weight relatively closer to each other. Another limitation was the for the silver powder, or the biggest one. The drawing here shows the inability to enter the house, but really, some ions do go through the house. Also, one of the concepts that they, they didn't get through was the concept of different charges. Um, well, so silver ion, which is this one, <coughs> are, they have the difficulty of entering because of the positive charge. And a nanoparticle has this one, has the easiest time to enter. If the door had like a no happy people sign, and that didn't allow the Ag plus or the positive one ion that, uh, that is respective to their positive behavior, it would force the ions to go not through the door, but the window here, which acts as the ion channels in this case. That is all. Thank mm -hmm. you for listening. Thanks. All right, so now is the time where we ask for questions from the audience. We would love a parent or colleague or instructor to start this off. And uh, for the presenters, uh, please repeat the question that they ask so that, again, our live streamers can hear, and just to make sure that everyone here hears as well. So questions? Yes. yes. Oh, OK. So I, yeah. So um, we oh, had a device yeah. called a manometer where it's like a tube and there was a stopper at the end of the tube with like a, a what? Liquid. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so there was like a stopper at the end of the tube which we put on top of the flask. Inside of the manometer, which is like a tube that leads out, we put liquid like inside and then we measured the distance where the liquid moved. So, it would be so like the nanoparticles, they did... Um, so when we put the nanoparticles in with the yeast cells, they produced the least amount of carbon dioxide, which showed that they were the least alive. And in that way, the nanoparticles were able to kill the yeast cells the fastest. And this was followed by the ions and then the silver powder. Um, so like in this image, you can see that the police, the second robber, the police has to call for backup because the damage was so severe. And this was show like how the nanoparticles killed the cells the most. And then the first robber, um, since the damage is only a little, he thinks that he can go after the robber himself. And in the last one, the last robber, nothing happens, so the police doesn't need to go after them. So in our experiment, the more carbon dioxide that was produced, the more alive? The more yeah, no. no, the more carbon dioxide that was produced, that meant that the yeast cells weren't killed as fast. Yeah. So the less amount of carbon dioxide that was produced, the more the yeast cells were killed. So the equal amounts of the liquid was pushed by the carbon dioxide, and the difference 
it the show it shows yeah, that's the, what we yeah. measured yeah. Yeah. yeah okay any other audience questions yes yeah on the second example where you said that you had to call the call it for a backup <laughs> what is the backup who is the backup um oh. so his question was for the oh. bottom part the second part who was the backup and um we're not sure who the illustrator was trying to call for backup but i would assume it would be other police, police officers yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned uh, very correctly that uh, one, of the, one of the limitations of this drawing was that it would be difficult to represent the true differences in size between the ions versus the nanoparticles versus the bulk silver. Um, can you guys share what those actual sizes are? So an ion is less than a nanometer, I believe, whereas a um, nanoparticle is like Oh, so the nanoparticles that we created were about oh, eight, eight nanometers, nanometers in size. whereas like the ion is like less than a nanometer. And then for the powder, you can you see, can yeah, like, see you it. can actually see it. So, so it's yeah. larger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess just uh, one more generally for the audience, how how big is nano roughly? Ten to the negative nine. Yeah. Nanometers. yeah. So uh, in other words, like if it was a fraction fractional thing with a meter, do you know what fraction of a meter it would be? Do you remember that? Wait, no, one billion? I, I, think one you, I think you just said it. Can oh, you want to say it? One over one billion? Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so a nanometer is a, is a billionth of a meter, exactly. Good. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so team two, Brian, John, Kyle. Let's give them a round of applause as well. Hello, I'm Brian. I'm John. And I'm Kyle. Um, so in this drawing, there's an elephant in the top left corner and basically there's a lake right there and there's a dog which is thinking about how, how many of it would take to be like the size of an elephant. So when the elephant goes into the water, the water level rises and the dogs suddenly think of a plan to figure out the measurement. So the dogs basically go into the water and the water level rises. And in the next scene, the water, when more dogs get in, the water level rises to the same height as the elephant. And so they figured out that the volume of six dogs is equal to one elephant. So in our monolayer lab, we dealt with indirect measurement, which is the use of proportions, the find, and unknown value. So what we did was we measured the volume of a drop of oleic acid, and uh, we dropped the drop on water, and it spread out to form a uh, circle, or a single monolayer. And a monolayer is a layer that is uh, a single molecule thick. So we were able to uh, find the radius of that monolayer, and knowing the, uh, the volume of the monolayer, we were able to calculate the height. And because a monolayer is a single molecule thick, that height was the size of a single molecule of oleic acid. So in this uh, picture, the uh, oleic acid is represented by or actually, this is just um, an example of indirect um, measurement. So because of the proportion of six dogs to one elephant, they were able to calculate the uh, volume or the amount, number of dogs that would fit in the water. In the next scene, which is at the bottom, there's a campfire which is not lit and a bunch of humans around it. And when the campfire is lit, all the humans go towards the fire and their hands are outwards towards the warmth. So in our lab, the reason why the uh, oleic acid molecules formed a monolayer, monolayer is because they're amphiphilic, meaning that one end is hydrophobic or water-fearing, and the other end is hydrophilic or water-loving. So the hydrophilic end wants to be in the water, and the hydrophobic end wants to be outside of the water. And the lowest energy state for those molecules is for the hydrophobic uh, molecules to be out of the water, and hydrophilic molecules to be in the water. So here, the people represent the oleic acid molecules, and their hands are the hydrophilic ends that are near the fire, which represents the water. 
and their backs are the hydrophobic ends that are far away from the water because they don't want to be in near the fire. In the final part, which is on the right side, it shows um, it shows ocean waves reflecting off a sea barrier, and at beneath it, it shows the ocean waves which go past the human. And in the very bottom, it shows a dolphin tapping on the heads of humans. So uh, this basically represents how um, in those light uh, microscopes that you could uh, usually use in middle school and high school in like your lab. It shows like how those microscopes, when they shine light onto your sample, um, well, if you have a sample that's actually on the nanoscale level, the light would actually go through and you won't be able to be able to like magnify, actually see uh, that sample in, in that nanoscale level. So what we use instead is called what a, it's called a atomic force microscope, which basically uses a uh, very small like middle school uh, needles that rapidly poke along the surface of your sample and it would basically basically like visualize what what that sample is by using only touch. So uh, one of the limitations of this drawing was that it was not able to show how light can be used to view um, substances or samples at the nanoscale and at a larger scale such as maybe like space and uh, that was, this is limited because these were all about um, moderately sized particles or like drawings and nothing really involved anything much larger or much smaller. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, hot, hot tip for all the presenters. When you are done, perhaps say thank you. Are there any questions? And then everyone will know that you are done. Uh, good job, guys. Um, OK, so uh, questions? Yes? You said at the very end that the drawings didn't adequately show the last part of Trunk. What, what kind of drawing would you have thought of to represent that, the very last point? Um, I think it would have been possible to show maybe the macro scale using just slightly different situation. So for example, instead of gathering around a fire, it could be like planets orbiting around um, like a sun um, in space, and or it could also be used uh, similarly uh, for uh, on the nanoscale with uh, like electrons orbiting around the nucleus of an atom, or like being close to the nucleus of an atom. So I think that maybe using both of those could have shown like similarities between those two scales. Oh yeah, and please again repeat the question. Sorry, I forgot to remind you guys about that. Uh, Ty. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, that you can use light to, to um, basically look at things on the nanoscale. I know that you can do this in an indirect way. What is the way that like, you can use light to look at things on the nanoscale even though they're smaller than the wavelength? Um, so the question was, what are the ways you can use um, light to view things on the nanoscale. <laughs> I, I mean, oh, go ahead. Like, well, no, it wouldn't be, it would just be, it wouldn't be electrons. Would it? I believe he might be referring, just to give you guys some help, uh, he might be referring to the other part of your lab. Yeah. Oh, the diffraction thing. So um, what, uh, another part of the lab was diffraction, which is uh, light, when light uh, reaches an obstacle or an opening, it will uh, separate. So we were able to view how laser was, se uh, laser was separated by um, a nanoscale uh, opening and a nanoscale uh, obstacle. So that's kind of, that helped us to measure the uh, size or the wavelength, the, the, the size of that, um, those, that opening, that obstacle. Yes? When drawing the uh, nanoparticles and trying to stay warm by the fire, did you test it all with the uh, heat of the water to see whether or not the nanoparticles could be more or less hydrophilic? Um, no, we did not. Um, or the question was, did we test with, uh, by heating uh, we're, like, test the heat of the molecules to uh, see 
how hydrophilic they uh, become, or like the oleic acid becomes, and uh, we did not um, test that in this uh, lab. Do you have an idea of, of an answer that if you did heat it up, if it, would something happen? I believe that heating it up would probably make the uh, oleic acid molecules less hydrophobic. Um, it, it might, actually. I, I mean, we have not done this, so we're not really totally sure. I mean, I think you would have to go to pretty elevated temperatures to see any sort of difference, at which point you would probably just be boiling water. I don't think anything that approaches the, the temperature of boiling water, though, would do would do too much to, to change the, the interaction. But my uh, reasoning for that might be because, for example, if you put olive oil on water and you heat uh, that, then the olive oil at a higher temperature will mix better with the water. Good answer. Any other, any other questions? If not, actually, before we thank our, our presenters, and we will, one, and I forgot to do this for the first drawing, so I will ask that person to stand up next. But first of all, could the person who did this drawing please stand up so we may acknowledge your artistic achievement? Well done. Is there, a, is there anything that you did in the drawing that they, that they didn't pick up on? Thank you. All right. Good job, guys. And also, uh, could, the, could the artist behind this drawing also stand up so that we may acknowledge you? <laughs> Nicely done. Did the, did the presenters for this drawing uh, miss any concepts that you wanted to add? Nice. All right. Good job. Cool. All right. So uh, team three, Jawe, UK, Crystal, come on up. And let's give them a round of applause as well. Um, hello everyone, I'm Crystal. I'm Yuki. I'm Carrie. And today we'll be explaining this drawing for you guys. Um, so basically this drawing is based off of a lab where we observed bi and created biopolymers. So in this lab we had six flasks, flasks of iota carrageenan and um, each with different concentrations of CaCO2 ranging from 0.0% to 0.5%. Um, these solutions were all heated to prevent them from solidifying and gelling up. Um, so basically, the purpose of this lab was to observe the time it took for each solution to solidify. And after that, we used um, pennies to determine the elasticity of each gel. So um, from our observations, we found that the 0.5 um, CaCO2 concentration um, gel had, took the shortest time um, to solidify and was the most elastic, 
while the 0, 0.0 um, concentration didn't gel at all. Um, after that part, we added an enzyme to a gelatin sample, and it broke apart and became a liquid. Okay, so here's a, a drawing that represents the, the experiment. So firstly, there's the two workers. They are built the uh, rail, railroad. And so at the first time, they just built like two wooden um, borders. So, so when the trial goes through this railroad, it just broken and bounds off. So the next time, um, the workers are trying to build more wooden border so so the next time the train is going going that successfully but like six months later because it's it, it is wood so there's a termite that it most part of the wood so the next time the trial when trial goes through the road it just bounds off again so the fi finally the worker is realized that and to build the Replace the wood by the iron. Okay, so. You can adjust the microphone. <laughs> um, so the boards in the in the middle of the uh, rails they connect the two rails. Um, so the boards here. They connect the two rails, and they shows the um, the calcium ions um, that connects the iota carrageenan we use in the lab, and they form the iota carrageenan polymer. And and in the experiment, when the calcium um, concentration uh, increases, the gels form quicker. Um, quick the jaws form quicker and st stronger, so um, this person shows that by, um, like when they have two boards um, in the middle of rails, um, the train just derails, but then uh, when it increases the concentration of the boards um, here, the, um, the trains can go through it like, perfectly. And so, and this part shows uh, when the enzyme, uh, the enzyme can break down the gel polymer, so it shows by the termite eating all the boards, so it's like the enzyme, and then uh, it also so shows how um, the polymer is formed by exact repeats and or, or repeats of a certain type of uh, monomers um, by showing how the rails are made by um, the repeats of the um, boards. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's an, we, our group is unclear about like the last picture. So it is that it, the wood is replaced by the, an iron. So at this point, uh, so we just don't know so why it should be replaced by the iron. And our guess is like the different connection in biopolymer determining strength and functionality of resulting network. And another part is um, we saw the, um, per the student can add more concept that um, is heating and cooling affect um, biopolymer bo struct structure. So as so as the um, railroad is, is um, replaced by an um, iron, the iron can be expanded when the um, weather is hot. So when it reaches a limit, it will like broke. But like when the weather is cold, so they will compress together, so we just make it stronger. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any questions? I will, so I'll start off with a question, um, and I'll give you, I'll help you guys figure out the last panel. Um, so you guys mentioned, I think you mentioned that the termites are representing what concept here? The enzyme breaking down the... Yeah, good. So, so, what, so what is it about then 
the enzyme that is, that is sort of unique compared to like other ways of, of breaking it down? Uh, so like the only animal that eat the wood, like the, it's the ants. So like um, um, the human really like looks seriously at the ants when like our home have ants or the ter termites, they will like call please to like destroy it. Mm -hmm. So like this one is like enzyme that's the only thing that, um, not the only thing, but it's like the same function that will destroy the, um, the po polymer. Right, so then uh, if it's iron instead of wood, then would the termites be able to, to consume it? Uh, so the termites will not like eat it, so it's not wood. Exactly. So then, so then, what term do you think I would be trying to hint at if the enzymes would eat one thing but not another thing? Oh, I realized that because like in our lab, there's like the blue gel and the transparent gel. So like the the iron is like the blue gel, which enzyme cannot break it, and the wood is like the transparent gel, which the enzyme can break it to liquid. So do you guys remember the the term for that? With that, it's like enzyme degrading. So specificity was the thing I was trying to think of, right? Mm -hmm. So that so that it only breaks down a certain type of thing and not another thing. But nicely done. Uh, any other questions? Anything that the yes. yes question over there. What about the calcium ions make from uh, pollen weed uh, to uh, pollen insects? Oh. So the calcium ions have two positive, um, two positive charges, and the um, alpha carrageenan it has like um, each has one negative charge, so it can like get the electrons and then they connect together. So as a follow up to that, does is the charge of the calcium compared to the charge of the iota carrageenan represented here? Um, in this picture, it's not that clear. But um, it's it shows like the connection and the bond, but it doesn't specifically show like the charges of like say like the rail and the wood versus the wood. So it, I think it could be made more clear in that way. I think I I think I might actually see it. So if so, if you're looking at the rails, how many rails are there on the the track? Two. Two. And then how many how, how many blocks of wood would it take to just even make a, any connection between the two? Just one, it would just take one block of wood to connect them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what charge ratio do you think could be represented then? Two, four, two, to, two to one ratio? Plus two, right? So if each calcium has a plus two charge, each block of wood can, can bring two of those rails or two iota carrageenans together. So that is, that is how I think that this art is meant to represent it. Any other questions? Yes, one more question. Oh, I just like, who is the artist behind this project? That's a great question. <laughs> Would the artist behind this please stand up? Yeah. <laughs> artist, would you would you like to uh, is there anything that, that that they that they didn't capture or that, no. that I didn't get? No, yeah, no, it was good. It was great. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Which Kyle? There's, Kyle? there's two Kyles. John Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good job. All right. Uh, next team, team four. Catherine, Madeline, Anushka. Round of applause. All right. Laser pointer on buttons right there if you would like to use it. Um, I'm Kate. I'm Maddie. Oh, and I'm Anushka. And um, our drawing is about photolithography, which is basically using light to transfer a pattern. Um, so we used a material called photoresist, which is a polymer 
that uh, can either be positive or negative, and um, positive being where the material that's exposed to the UV light is soluble, and then negative is when the areas that are not exposed to the UV light are soluble. So in our experiment, we used positive PR, and uh, we placed a mask on top, which is essentially like a stencil, and then we exposed it under a UV light to uh, create the pattern. So uh, next, we used a developer solution to remove all of the photoresist that was exposed because it was a positive PR. And then another step was to etch off all of the copper that was underneath the photoresist to remove everything that was not included as part of the pattern. And um, the final step was to scrub off the remaining photoresist on top of the copper that was part of the pattern, leaving us only with a pattern of small metal wires, which was the same pattern as the original mask. So this, um, top, this process is called a top-down approach, where material is etched or removed from a bulk existing product. So the analogy that the artist used was a cake, and there was like cats in it. So through blocks two through seven, we it was they presented the six steps of lith photolithography using in box two to represent the photoresist. They used the fondant to coat the cake. And in box three, the fondant is aligned with the airbrush stencil rather than a circuit board being aligned with a photo mask. In box four, the fondant is exposed with the airbrush paint. And box five, the edges are developed through the removal of fondant rather than us removing the photo mask from the circuit board. In six, the airbrushed cat is etched by an icing spade right there. And in, photo, in box seven, the image is stripped by the removal of the fondant, which leaves an imprint of the cat on the cake. Then our artist represented the feature size effects function and highlighted that the fact that smaller structures are better and more portable. And to do that, they use cupcakes because cupcakes are lighter. As you can see the kilograms to the grams. And finally, the weird flies that are all over the cupcakes are used to show a clean room, which in most like professional photo photolithography labs, they it's a clean room and you're like required to wear a bunny suit to prevent any dust from affecting the final image. And so to show that she had flies, which the cat ate, and the cat got sick. All right, so I was tasked with telling you with all the little odds and ends of some technology like this. And so all of this is, I mean, fairly useless if you don't apply it you know, in the real world. And so an example that we were told is um, oftentimes this type of technology is used to make transistors. And as this technology gets better and better, the transistors get smaller and smaller. And so there was a guy named Moore. I'm, um, he basically hypothesized something that became Moore's law, which is basically the law that these uh, transistors um, in these like compressed circuits, basically the amount of transistors that you'll be able to fit in a given space will double year after year after year. Um, and so in order to both make sure that your thing works, as well as kind of see on the nanoscale what it looks like and the topography of it, uh, scientists often use what is called a SEM microscope, which stands for scanning electron microscope. And so how this works is that you have a narrow beam of electrons, which you essentially, which you essentially shoot at your sample which you've already pre-coded in some type of conductive material, which is oftentimes like gold or palladium or platinum. And then based on that, based on your readings of kind of which electrons bounced off, you can tell what the surface of your sample was. Any questions? Um, 
I mean, I, I'm not really sure with cake. I mean, it's kind of hard with cake. But, like, an example that I would kind of give is, like, if you decided to open a bakery and you decided that baking one cake at a time was not efficient enough for you for how much batter you had and how much money you were making, so you decided to make smaller and smaller cupcakes. And so, like, the analogy makes sense till a point and then it starts to break down, but essentially kind of like that. But I think that's a great analogy, right? Because if you have an oven of a certain size, then you can only, you know, bake so much of a thing one mm -hmm. day at a time. Exactly. And you want to maximize you your profits. If you more components or more pieces into that oven, you could get something where you make more money as mm -hmm. a result. So that's, but that's a very good analogy. Yes? Um, so you mentioned that the dust is very important in the mm -hmm. lithography. Well, in photolithography, we there was a lot of oils, and we used like a lot of liquid and UV light, and so the oils like on our fingers or the dust would go in, and when it was, I forget the word. Sorry, when it was exposed with the UV light, the fingers like the oils from our fingers would thoroughly like affect the picture and make like deep like dark brownish imprints on the circuit board in the photo mask which did not allow us to collect like any energy data in the end and so the dust would have the same effect and the funny thing is we actually accidentally left a photo like a circuit board out and we came back today to find it all darkened and like almost like unnoticeable due to like the light and all the fingers that have like touched it throughout the day. Other questions from parents or other questions from parents or students? If not, then uh, can the artists who did this please stand up and put some count? Uh, artist, is there any concepts in here that you tried to portray that they, they didn't catch? So I'm not sure you use like the 10, so like on the one side, I don't, I can't read the handwriting. Nine, it's like, it's a, there's like a cake pin on the, on the right, it's like a, a cupcake pin, so that's like nailed down. And the queen room, like the cat got sick, so she was doing like a smile, so yeah, that's it. Nice, thank you. All right, good job ladies, thank you. All right, uh, team five. Karthik, Kyle, Andrew. Let's give team five a round of applause. So, so teams five and 10 actually had a pretty interesting challenge because they uh, are presenting on an experiment that they just did this morning and presenting another team's drawing that did the drawing during lunchtime. So, uh, so this was drawn by a group uh, in probably less than an hour, I would say, which is, which is going to be interesting. So, um, so let's wish our teams luck. Oh, and then, sorry, here's the on button for the... Okay, hi everyone, I'm Kyle. I'm Karthik. I'm Andrew. Uh, so first, I'm gonna start off by explaining like what the experiment is about. So in this experiment, we pretty much just made supercapacitors, which are basically like a medium between batteries and regular capacitors, because they sort of have, they can store the energy that batteries store, but they also have like the power of capacitors. Um, so batteries, the way they store energy is they have uh, chemical reactions in the middle, or inside, which is why they don't really have like a strong burst of energy as much as they can like store energy. Um, so they're using like devices like cars and like computers and stuff that like needs to needs to stay on for a long time, as opposed to capacitors, which uh, don't really store energy that well because they sort of have a sudden burst of power instead. And the way they work is that electrons move in between oppositely charged um, plates, and so an example of like. A capacitor would be like um, the 
a camera light, which is or a camera flash, which sort of just like doesn't need to stay on for a long time. It just it's just like a flash and then it goes off. And so supercapacitors are basically like in between both the battery and the capacitors. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about the picture. So over here, so there's three pictures in total over here. And as you can see in each one at the top, there's gonna be a body of water. And so as Kyle said, um, the batteries uh, have the most energy. So in the first photo, you can see it's the largest body of water compared to the other two. So then you can uh, assume that that's the, where the most energy is. And we can assume the first picture is a battery. And also because right here is the power where there's a lot of small holes, which means there isn't as, enough, uh, as much power as energy. And so the third picture is gonna be a capacitor. And so it's because it has the smallest, it has the smallest body of water, which means it has the smallest amount of energy. And it has big gaping holes through the dam, which means it has the most power. And then the second photo is gonna be the super capacitor. And it's because it has, um, it's in the middle between, it's in the middle between these two for the size of body of water, which means it uh, has the second highest amount of energy. And it's flowing through over the top, which means it has the second uh, highest amount of power. So it's kind of, you get the best of both worlds. And if, when we're talking about energy versus power, we're basically saying that power is really just defined as energy over time. Okay, so um, there's, in our lab, we, uh, we didn't do this, but there's actually a way to turn a capacitor into a supercapacitor. And uh, the way you do this is, if you look at the equation for capacitance, which is basically just the measure of an abilities of like a material, material's ability to hold electric charge, and um, capacitance is given to you by the equation C. Capacitance equals a constant, which depends on the type of material you're, material you're using, multiplied by the uh, area of the charge plates divided by the distance between those two charge plates. So if you want to increase capacitance, you could uh, either, or do both, you could increase the area of the plate, so the plate's larger, and more electrons can jump back and forth between them, or you can decrease the distance, where if the plates are closer, the electrons don't have to jump as far. And I think they represented uh, the increase of area here because this is, uh, they wrote here, this is, a, this is a dam. So you have more water flow overflowing the dam that represents uh, just more like, just more area where the electrons can travel. But in this example, it's just more water. And sadly, um, I think they tried to, but I couldn't see a decrease in distance. So uh, if one thing could be improved about this drawing, it's that they could have represented uh, how you can turn a capacitor into a supercapacitor by also decreasing the uh, distance, which is not represented. But in good drawing overall, it's really clear for us to decipher. Are there any questions? Uh, I don't necessarily. I don't necessarily think so. Um, I don't think distance is represented here, but that could be interpretation. That's something we didn't think about. Um, any questions about difference between batteries and capacitors? Yeah. So it's, um, we kind of known that uh, capacitors um, don't necessarily do chemical reactions uh, to uh, transfer power, like capacitors or electrons to different uh, positive recharge plates to a negative recharge plate, whereas like Uh, better, better. I don't think they've show. I don't think they've um, uh, in this drawing. I think they just captured like the high energy reserve of the battery as it's like its defining point and its low power output as its second defining point. And for the capacitor, it's the opposite. You have very low energy reserves, but you have extremely high power output. So I don't think they were aiming to so much as capture how a uh, capacitor, how a capacitor is built or constructed differently than a battery and vice versa. They're just trying to describe their uh, two most prominent attributes if that answers your question. Uh, you? So I noticed that <laughs> the water flows has some fixed plane in there. Do you think that means different? Uh, right, so I don't think, I, th I think the fish are there just because the artist really likes fish. I mean, this person has, <laughs> this person has drawn like a lot of aquatic examples in the past. So yeah, this person just likes fish. Uh, I hope that answers your question. 
I have a question. Yes. Uh, so I forgive me if you said this and I missed it, but can you uh, elaborate on how in the actual lab you had an increased surface area? Uh, in the actual lab, we had an increased we had an increased surface area because we um we had c very fine carbon powder and we mixed uh, isopropyl alcohol as well as uh, citric acid and another ingredient whose name that I forgot. We turned this powder into a really fine dough and we increased the surface area of this dough just by kneading it, forming like the uh, thinnest layer possible so that it spreads out over a larger surface area. And depending on how thin you could get the dough, um, that's your surface area, basically. So which ingredient made the high surface area then? Uh, the dough. But what ingredient in the dough actually caused the high, made the high surface area? Uh, I want to say the isopropyl alcohol because it made the dough um, easier to knead. Uh, can you think of a different ingredient that might be the, Maybe the actual one? citric acid. <laughs> nope. Keep trying. Think about it. Was it the carbon? Yes. So because it was like really small, so then like the surface area to volume ratio is high. Exactly. So it's a high surface area carbon that you guys actually use, and you did you did flatten out the dough to also have most of that carbon try to be exposed, but it's really the the carbon itself that is the the high surface area. Can you guys uh, explain like? relatively speaking to just like a flat, you know, piece of, of metal or a dielectric, how much more surface area the carbon actually has comparatively? Uh, com comparatively, we, in our post lab analysis, we found out that, um, found out that you would need probably 11, some more over 11,000 uh, square meters of surface area to just, to just, I think, uh, light a light bulb for 10 seconds. And that, and that is 2.2 uh, football fields of square, of area, but surprisingly, it's only five point something grams of that carbon powder that we used, so a lot. Yes. All right, cool. Any other questions from the audience? One more question, yes. All right, uh, so good. Uh, her question was, are supercapacitors supposed to re release more or less energy than regular capacitors? And um, I think the answer wait, the answer is less, but um, I can see why the drawing is like, kind of confusing. It's because, it's because um, supercapacitors are kind of the bridges between batteries and capacitors where they don't have the super like, energy storing ability of batteries, but they don't output like the crazy amounts of power uh, capacitors do, but they're... Huh? I don't think the picture's. I don't think the picture's wrong. No. Yeah, yeah but um, I think ultimately their their goal is that this uh, uh, <coughs> produces more water than. Well. Oh <coughs> no. This produces more water than uh, this. Like more. It's a bigger power output. It's not clear. It took us a while to decipher, but we got we got it in the end. Um, can the artist for this one maybe uh, stand up and try to uh, clarify Wait, the question? Yeah. <laughs> so, for the capacitors, I was trying to have like giant pipes coming from the body of water out, so it's like pushing out water at a much more rapid rate than the supercapacitors. That's like supposed to not be like a lot of water coming out, it's just more surface area for the water to be flowing over rather than a lot of water coming out of it. Yeah. Any, any more other, questions? Any other questions? If not, then uh, let's thank our artists and our presenters. <laughs> so let's take um, just a very quick uh, five minute stretch and bathroom break and uh, we'll be back here in about five minutes and we'll keep going. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. You can you can leave whenever you need to. I appreciate that. Thank you. Me? Uh, yeah.
Okay, so um, Mark, are we are we streaming? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, so uh, Team Six, you want to come on deck? Cameron, Mika, Matthew, let's give them a round of applause as well. Here's the the thing. There's the on button for the um, oh, for the laser pointer. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Mihika. I'm Cameron. I'm Matthew. And today we'll be talking about um, silver nanoparticles biotoxicity. And biotoxicity refers to when environmental toxins are introduced to living organisms. So basically for a little bit of context, what we did in this experiment was we took three types of silver, nanoparticles, ions, and powder, and we mixed each of those separately with yeast powder, and then we measured the gas production that was created by each of these mixtures. And basically the reason wh why we did this was because the making of CO2, or carbon dioxide, is a result of cellular respiration, which is a process that occurs in healthy cells. So the less CO2 production equals greater silver, silver toxicity. All right, so starting from the top up there, we can see that there are uh, people just lining up to get into the theater. It's hard to see from far away, but there are different types of tickets. There's the kids who enter for free, and then the adults uh, right there who go in for $5, and then the cocktail lady who goes in for $20. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, basically, this basically represents uh, like different mechanisms in the first concept where we were just talking about how each size of silver, which means like each like tier of tickets, they all get into the theater, but they all just enter a different way with different like standards. Okay, so during this experiment, we also learned how all forms of silver damage the cell um, in the same way. So in the image, we can see how the premium person, um, the adult and the children are all spilling the drink and they're all damaging the cell, which in this case is the movie theater. Okay, so another important concept of this experiment was that different sizes of silver can have different effects or levels of toxicity on cells. So the silver nanoparticles had the greatest level of, the, or the greatest toxic effect on the yeast cells because they're the smallest. So the yeast cells pertained it to be food and took it in through endocytosis. So as you can see, that relates to the picture because on the bottom you have the small, small children who are the smallest people here and they make the biggest mess. And then you have the adults up here who make a slightly smaller mess and then you have the fancy cocktail lady, whatever. And she makes a small mess. So that kind of relates to the nanoparticles versus the ions versus the powder um, in the experiment. Okay, so this guy right here on the side for each one, it's basically like one of those, like after you leave a movie theater, there's that one guy who's just waiting for everyone to get out so that he can like clean up the theater. So on the top you have the fancy cocktail lady. She didn't spill that much, so she, he only has like one paper towel. And then right here, they spilled like a bit more of the adults so that he has more paper towels. And right there, all the kids are making a mess. So he has like t 10 of them and he's like, dead and he's like upset. So this basically repre like represents how um, in the actual experiment we measured how the amount of <coughs> CO2 which shows if the uh, cells are like dead or alive. Um, but in here it's just using uh, the cleanup guy as a, the metaphor to explain the amount of paper towels show how much of a mess there is to be cleaned up. Okay, so adding on we thought that this image captured um, the experiment very well and then the, the metaphor itself um, helped explain this um, process. Um, an additional concept that we thought could, that could have been added was um, the different forms of silver in terms of color and how smaller particles have shorter wavelengths. Yeah, so one other limitation was the fact that, <clears throat> sorry, the kids versus the adults versus the older lady, um, they're very similar in size in real life, and the nanoparticles, ions, and powders are very, um, very, are obviously very different in size, and you can't really represent that in real life because the nanoparticles and stuff are so small. Um, but that was pretty much the only limitation to this that we saw besides the concepts that weren't mentioned. But yeah, so thank you li for listening. Is there any questions? Um, if you look at the very top, it's really hard to see from where you're sitting, but the little ticket sign, it says kids are free and then adults are five and then premium is $20. So 
we kind of figured that the ones in the middle were adults because they were buying adult tickets. So yeah, it would make sense if it was kids, students, adults, but just the way that they drew it, it wasn't like that. I have a question. So I just want to make sure that you guys have the size thing correct, because I know in this case it might be a little switched from how it actually is. So which, which of the three is representing the nanoparticles? The kids. The kids, because the they're the smallest. Yeah. So, and which in the actual experiment is the smallest? Nanoparticles. Not the nanoparticles, but the Oh, sorry, ions. the ions. The ions, right? So, um, so in this case, even though the kids are doing the most damage, um, it is kind of flipped from the yeah. experiment, right? Because in the, in the experiment, uh, like you said, the, the ions are the smallest. And, in, and for all three of them, what is actually doing the, the damage? Oh, what's actually doing the damage is like the toxic nature of the silver. The silver, which, which silver, or what silver? The nanoparticles, because it got into the... But what are the nanoparticles and the bulk and the ions all like what are what are the bulk and the nanoparticles releasing to do the damage? Do you remember? The plus one ion. The ions, yeah. right? So it's always ions that are doing the damage. But just in the case of the the nanoparticles, it's it's actually able to release the most ions into the cell because it as a whole like chunk gets into the cell, whereas the ions have to go in individually and it's slow. And the bulk releases so few of them, right? So. Good. Just wanted to make sure that that was that that was clear because I know that with the children being actually smaller than adults, that that gets confused. Then that could be confusing. In the picture, it implies that the janitor can clean up the mess afterwards. Do you get a sense that the silver ions uh, effectively killed off the yeast cells completely, or was there an opportunity to perhaps remove the ions that were needed to put in and keep some of the yeast cells alive? Well, I pers well the question was like um, if. The, like how the janitor like shows like which one like got killed or whatever like in relating to the experiment. So I mean with the kids it shows like it's really hard to see from here but like the eyes are like X out kind of thing. And like in that situation um, I guess it would the, the, in the experiment there would be like a little bit of like CO2 um, created but like most of them got killed like really fast. But like in the terms of like the other ones they can still clean up the mess but it's just more I guess. It wasn't very like specific. So then to follow up, in the case of the, the bulk silver, so it is doing some damage, right? Yes. But um, if you didn't see anything, like some groups actually saw that even with some with the bulk powder, the, the ones there actually, the yeast maybe even seemed to do better. So why, why could that be the case? So what's also happening as yeast cells are being killed? What, what's the, what are the yeast also doing? Or what might they be doing? What do living things do? In respirate. General? Sorry. Res respirate. They respirate. That's one thing. Uh, what else? What else do? What else does life do? Multiply. Multiply, right? So what? What is the yeast then also doing that could be counteracting the effect of them being killed off? Reproducing. Reproducing, in, right? The time so yeah. so even if bulk silver can do some damage, it could be that the yeast is just reproducing at a greater rate that it kind of. As a, as a whole counteracts the damage that any sort of individual death of yeast might do to them as a colony. What do you think the charge represents? Like, like how they charge different amounts of mass? Do you think that has any significance to the silver? Uh, I mean, from what we interpreted, we just thought it was just like the different like kind of like tiers and like the size, like being like financial wise, like free is like the lowest and just higher, but I, we didn't really think Anything else of it? Well, and if we, you see the, sorry. Yeah. Okay, the premium entrance, the lady at the top, there's a separate entrance for her for everyone who has the premium tickets. So that sort of makes more sense in terms of the experiment with the bulk cells. So kind of go, going off of that, like how, so as Rita was saying, like the, the nanoparticles are the medium sized thing of the three before you get the sensors, right? How could you have changed this picture to more accurately reflect that? Like Um, you could have, instead of the kids being f 
free, you could have them have a certain char like a certain amount of money, just a very small, so that it would sort of make more sense because right now it's zero, which kind of implies that they just enter without a fee, sort of. So it would make more sense if they had a small charge. Like to get in. Well, okay, so I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, you were saying that the, the price of the ticket is kind of trying to show the size of the, of the store, right? But the, the, free, the free one here is the one that goes in the easiest, but in the case of the actual experiment that you guys did, the nanoparticles, which are the medium sized ones, got in the easiest. Um, and then that's, so that's like the size is one thing that you have to consider, and then the charge is charge on the particles is another one, right? The, the, as we saw from the previous proof that showed this experiment, the charge on those ions is something that's preventing them from getting in. So how could you think that they could go down? So I guess just w having one of the groups like not being able to make it in to the movie theater? Um, you could have the kids, um, if they're underage, they would need an adult or something to come into the movie with them. Um, because they're too young, say if it was PG-13 or something like that, and they need an adult to come in with them, so that was a limitation. All right, thank you guys. And um, can our artist for this one also stand up and let's thank the artist as well. Did they, um, was there anything else that you, that you tried to convey that was uh, not pointed out? Um, I think you're correct. Uh, all right, cool. Well, that's great. Thank you. All right, so team seven, Anuj, Kunal, Arjun. Let's give them a round of applause as well. So laser pointer is here. This is the on button. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. Hi, I'm Kunal. Hi, I'm Arjun. Hi, I'm Anuj. So uh, we're going to be uh, analyzing another representation of uh, what another student uh, in this class drew uh, to represent what we uh, learned in class. So uh, this is a representation of what we learned on Monday. Uh, we did a lab where we uh, used uh, a technique called indirect measurement, which is very important um, for science. Uh, and I'll explain why later. Uh, but basically what we did is we took um, some oil um, and we dropped it on water. Um, and what we were aiming to do is by doing this uh, form a monolayer, which is basically um, a one molecule thick layer um, of oil, right? Um, and by measuring the radius of this um, monolayer, which was probably like, what, two inches, right? Uh, or like around two inches, um, we could measure that with a simple ruler uh, and using uh, formulas that we could learn in elementary school, such as a volume formula, um, calculate the area of the circle, um, and also uh, using uh, using this, uh, as well as the uh, volume of the actual oil that we put into the water, calculate um, how thick the layer was in terms of height, which is um, measuring something that's on the nanoscale. So pretty cool that we could use an indirect measurement to find something uh, with such simple tools. Okay, so indirect measurement is using proportions and ratios to measure all things, whether they're extremely big or they're extremely small. Uh, so in this case, there's a group of construction workers um, right there, and what they're trying to do is they're like trying to make a building. And so what they do is they create a small model of the building, and later they use um, proportions to determine like the actual size of the building. Um, and so indirect measurement is just really important to science, um, and scientists use it when like their tools cannot measure um, things of certain magnitudes because they're either too big or they're too small. All right, so um, moving on to the next portion of the drawing here, we see that up in this top corner that two groups are arguing based on the color of the building that they're creating. So what? this is meant to represent is constructive and destructive interference. So in waves, um, constructive interference is when the top and bottom of the waves all line up and they combine to create a wave of larger height or amplitude. And uh, destructive interference is when the top and bottoms actually cancel out and 
they create a wave that is uh, lower or has a smaller height than that of it, what it was earlier. So as we can see in this first scenario, um, the two groups have compromised and have created a half and half based on the colors portrayed here. And they have a uh, complete building and in scenario two, we can see that uh, both groups are still arguing based on the color that they want, and they've ended with absolutely nothing, which represents how the waves detract from each other. So this is a somewhat uh, more simple representation of more complex uh, you know, subjects is really important in science to be able to explain to people um, subjects that usually require uh, more studying to look into. But uh, this has its limitations, um, and no an analogy is like perfect. One way we thought we could make this one better is um, in the in regards to constructive interference. As you can see, they uh, they agreed on kind of like uh, how they can put their own design on the final building, uh, each of their own designs on the final building. Um, but if a wave constructively interferes with another wave, the resulting amplitude, uh, as he said, is the sum of those two waves. Uh, so the way that they could, this could be shown in the, in the picture is if the building on the left, the bottom left of the screen, uh, was the sum of the heights of uh, each group's original plan. Uh, so that'd be able to show how the amplitude of the wave uh, is, the, you know, is the product of both of them. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, so the question was, what technique uses constructive and destructive interference? Um, what do you mean by, like, what technique? You mean, like, what we use to see this in real life? Um, yeah. What, what do you use to see this? Or what is this explained in real life? And uh, what is it called? Like, what's the physical phenomenon? Okay, so what uh, the question was, uh, how can we see this in real life? Um, so you can see this in real life if, um, it's, this is basically diffraction, right? Um, and that's basically any phenomena that occurs um, when light uh, has to pass uh, around an obstacle um, or runs into an object like a slit. So basically, because um, light is both a wave and a particle, you can get some interesting effects when you have things like slits. So if you can imagine uh, like a pinhole, uh, two pinholes on a paper, when the light goes through those pinholes, um, those uh, light waves behave interestingly. And um, because they're waves, when they go through the pinholes and they come out, uh, they'll both come out um, as their own like wave. And then when it runs into that other wave, you can see interesting patterns where certain parts will have constructive interference and certain parts will have destructive interference. And what this will look like is certain parts will be brighter and certain parts will be darker. Um, and you can see kind of like this effect uh, where there's like patterns of light and dark next to each other. Uh, this can also be used to measure things on the nanoscale, which is also what we did today, but um, it's a little bit of a more complex process. But what you can kind of see like right now, I don't know if this is actually correct. Maybe the instructors can verify this, but. Um, certain like shading patterns under the projector screen you see there or to the right of it may that might result from like diffraction slightly. I'm not too sure about that. But something similar to that is what you could see in real life to know if you're seeing destructive or constructive interference. Does that answer the question? got like two, say you've got like the two different people, they've got two different patterns on them. Say if those patterns were not just patterns, but textures. Could you add AFM to this, uh, to this 
picture? Uh, so AFM stands for Atomic Force Microscope, and basically that uses, um, instead of using light and electrons, it uses um, like feeling as its way of identification. So uh, if you were to um, like do that on the building, maybe you could um, add features where not only you could um, see them, like right now we can see the circles and stripes on it. Instead of just having those, you might be able to have like physical objects protruding from the buildings that each group wanted um, that were maybe smaller protrusions, like not as big as the circles. And you could uh, have like a part of the picture which is like a zoomed in magnifying glass view of um, like these like protrusions and like people, I don't know, maybe sitting on them or something. Uh, something that represents physical touching, kind of, instead of just seeing. Yeah, or maybe if the, if the lines were like physical, like bumped up lines and the dots were bumped up dots. Say if you were one of those people, maybe you, if you were blind, you could know what floor you were on based off of what texture that part of the building was, right? So mm -hmm. that might be another way to, to try to incorporate that. Any, any last questions? Artists, will you, will you stand up? <laughs> was, was there anything else that is in the drawing that you wanted to point out, or did um, they pretty much get everything? No, there wasn't anything, but I believe that's the suggestion for those who collected the interest in the Nice. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, team eight. Hitesh, Jared, Joseph. Let's give them a round of applause. Right, so, laser pointer button. Hello, I'm Joseph. I'm Hitesh. And I'm Jared. And we'll be talking about disinterpretation of biopolymers today. In class, we learned about biopolymers. It's a revolutionary organic polymer that could be applied to practically anything you can think of. Specifically in class, we explored the topic of gelation of idocarrageenans and enzyme specificity. In class, we used calcium ions, which have a plus two charge, and idocarrageenans, which have parts of a negative one charge. And by using the catalyst, the calcium ions, we we're able to create different gels, hydrogels, with different strength at different speeds. So, gels in our lab, iota carrageen, uh, can become liquids again by, going, by coming in contact with the degrading enzyme. Uh, we use something called bromelain to break down our iota carrageenine. And in our drawing, the degrading enzyme is represented by a piranha, and it's chowing down on that giant piece of seaweed. And, it, and the, seaweed is represent, the seaweed represents our gel polymer. And and um, for number four, um, it requires that it requires us to look on the nanoscale. And in our polymer, we see that we go onto the nanoscale and we see cells representing the inside of the seaweed. Going back to the calcium catalyst, in can I have the in the picture? These octop how do you use this? <laughs> the octopuses over here represents the calcium ions, which binds to these strands of kelp, we assume, which represents the iodocarrageenins monomers. And over here is a barrier that shows that different concentrations of I of of calcium ions create different strengths as seen as the the slicing over here with the mermaid happily flying away from this bonding. So there are uh, a few things that uh, this artist could have included, which were not required, but the homework did say, you know, if you want to include this, you can also include that as well. So the first of which was heating and cooling. So in the actual experiment, what would have happened when we heated our uh, polymer gel? So I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, chemistry here. So uh, a very basic concept is that heat is energy. So an increase in heat is an increase in energy. 
So when we increase that heat, we can actually break these bonds between our polymer, which is our seaweed, and our calcium 2 plus, which is our octopi. So uh, we didn't see anything like that, any heating. So we thought that perhaps if there was some kind of predator, like maybe a shark that's supposed to represent heating. So that shark comes on and then all the octopi, you know, flee away so they don't get eaten. And that would be a way that our calcium 2 plus would be separated from our polymer, which is the seaweed. Now, another thing is that uh, different connections can uh, create different strengths. So I'm gonna go into more chemistry. So uh, we've got calcium, and now calcium uh, has two electrons flying around it that it would love nothing more than to get rid of. Now, along our polymer, our seaweed, it has all these spots that would love to gain an electron. So the natural thing is for our calcium to bond to that seaweed because it wants to get rid of it and the seaweed wants to gain it, or the polymer. So since calcium has two electrons it wants to get rid of, it can bond to two different places. However, if we, for example, used aluminum three plus, then it could bond to three different places. And that way it would create an even stronger uh, poly uh, polymer gel. So we didn't see that in here. So we thought, well, what if we included different animals that had different uh, positive charges to them? So maybe there was a fish that was meant to represent uh, lithium one plus, or maybe there was, I don't know, a squid that was meant to represent aluminum three plus, or some other way to show that different, uh, different ions can create different strengths. And there's one more concept that's a little bit confusing. So this is about how biopolymers can, uh, be, can act as a very strong scaffolding. So the best way I can think to explain this would be comparing the pyramids of Giza to the Eiffel Tower. And we actually saw that example in one of our courses. So uh, the both of these structures are equally strong, but the Pyramid of Giza is completely you know, solid. You can't really add anything to that. Meanwhile, the Eiffel Tower has got all these holes in it, so you could add more to it. Now, biopolymers act the same as the Eiffel Tower, where you can add more things to it. It just acts as this strong base that you can add things to. Thank you. But yep. uh, and one more thing I want to add, we couldn't think of we couldn't think of any way that this artist could have added uh, could have included that scaffolding concept. Thank you. Thank Does you. anyone have any questions? Aaron, come on! I know you've got questions out there. Okay, well, uh, so. So, by the way, the gentleman in the back said that the, there's heating and cooling. Anyone was wondering how it could affect the polymers? Well, what I would say is I think the best way is to assume that what we already have is a cooled version. Because in the, in the experiment that we did, we had these hot plates to keep them hot, to keep them separated. And uh, as, soon as, we took the, as soon as we took the calcium 2 plus and the polymer off those hot plates, some of those examples, they came together immediately. So, since these are already together, I would assume that this, what we have in this image, is the cooled version, but adding that predator, or I mean some other way of adding heat, would be the way that we show that it's been heated. And to add on to the topic of how heat affects hydrogels, as heat increases, the solubility of things such as iodic carrageenans and calcium ions increases. As a result, as it cools down, the hydrogel is able to form while, it's, while when it's hot, it maintains its soluble aqueous form. Blocks are called monomers. Monomers, right? So, so this looks like just sort of like a single, a single type, a polymer made up of a single type of monomer, right? Um, yeah. Do you remember what it's called when there's polymers made up of different types of monomers? And is there any way, possibly, that that could have been represented in this drawing? So, uh, when it comes to the name of it, I plead the fifth. But when it comes <laughs> to, when it comes to representing it. Uh, something that did occur to us is that perhaps, uh, I don't have the laser pointer on me, this 
could have been what you're referring to because it's not one specific monomer. It's these different, it's, you know, this stalk and it's also this bulb. But, uh, yeah, my, my compatriots weren't so sure about that, so we didn't include it. Yeah, for it to be a polymer, we, even with different ingredients, there has to be repetition of pattern. We could not see that clearly throughout that. But then the person who drew it could have included that with, say, like another kelp or something like that made of, made of more than one ingredient in a repeating pattern. So just for parents' knowledge out there, so it's a, it's a copolymer when it's made up of different types of monomers. And if it was repeating, it would be a, a block of polymers. <coughs> yeah. Any other, any other questions? Uh, artists, would you, would you stand up? Uh, I think, I think she had a question in the back. Oh. Yeah, iodocarrageenans it is a uh, polysaccharide based. A, oh wait, before I answer that, she she asked why iodocarrageenans may come from. And iodocarrageenan is a polysaccharide based polymer, and iodocarrageenans, um, I think it comes from an algae. So it actually, it comes from something that is directly in the drawing. Yeah. Uh, Which is kelp. Seaweed. Seaweed. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So it actually comes from seaweed. So it's actually a almost very literal <laughs> sort of metaphor in this case. Good question. Thank you for, for adding that. So now, artists, if you please uh, stand up to acknowledge you. Um, was there anything in addition to what they said that you had drawn that you wanted them to notice? All right, team nine, Ian, Ethan, Sihyun. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, here's the laser pointer. This is the on button, if you want to use it. So uh, my name is Ian. Hello, uh, my name is Ethan Borja. My name is Cheyenne. Yeah, so we were given this cartoon, and this cartoon is meant to represent an experiment that we did yesterday. And um, in that experiment, the main goal was to create these small copper wires through a process called photolith photolithography. So um, I'm gonna explain what's happening in these first five panels at the top. So um, this guy, he's at the tattoo shop, and he's getting a numbing gel put on his arm as like an initial layer. And then after that, the tattoo person is putting somewhat of a stencil over that um, numbing layer. And then he is shining a light on that stencil to help the stencil to stick to the arm, I guess. And then um, he's needling in the tattoo using the stencil. And then in the last one, he's taking away the stencil with a uh, cleaning solution. So this represents five of the six steps from our um, uh, experiment that we did. So the first step being um, a coating step in which a material is, like the base material is added to a sheet of cardboard. And it's just essentially just the base material um, and then the next step is the masking step. So you put um, like a patterned um, sheet of paper on top of this cardboard square. And what it does is after, in the next step, the ex exposure uh, step, when you shine uh, UV lighting on it, um, that pattern blocks the UV lighting in certain places and then exposes, or, yeah, exposes the rest of the, um, the rest of the material, so that way in the next step, the patterning step, when you, um, you like, <laughs> you like, uh, you, you put it in a, in a solution, 
the, the cardboard square after it's been exposed to the UV light, and you switch it around for a few minutes, and then uh, the material that had been exposed to the UV light is shed off, leaving only the um, pattern underneath. And then finally, uh, the last step is the strip step. So all the excess material is removed, leaving you with just the thin copper wires. Okay. Yeah. All right, so for the next uh, bottom two drawings, this is what I will be talking about. So, so first, as a, an important concept that, there, that is being said here is um, size and uh, like feature size. So basically the first left and right drawings are the same like concept as in it's both the tattooing, but the, the thing that changes the feature size is the size of the ink at the end. So that shows that and then in science like the wavelength is also represented because a bigger means a, like bigger wavelengths makes it slower and then um, the smaller wavelength makes it faster. So then also they represented that it's more uh, detailed with the smaller um, stencil or a smaller uh, tip. And then uh, in actual like real life, it's really important like that they're able to make these things smaller because like things like micro or uh, mic like chips, um, like the smaller they are, the more easily producible they are, like mass producible. Also, it's also cheaper because of the less material used. And it makes more space in whatever device the chip is being installed in for other like purposes and other technology. And also, it makes like a smaller device, which can make it more convenient in like many cases, like as we evolve as humans. And then um, also, uh, we use the top-down approach, which basically means we start from a bulk and we, we, uh, we use that to scale it down, possibly. So that basically how we learned about it, like a, like a kind of like a metaphor we used was we have a, like a marble, like a block of marble, and then we etch it or like we uh, break it down when you want to make our statue. And I think, yeah, that's important. So also uh, chips that are smaller, like uh, have smaller spaces for the electrons to travel. So that makes them faster and more uh, efficient. And that makes it, that's why it's really important for scientists, like that they're really uh, like engaging in this concept because they think that it's gonna help them for uh, more like productive devices. Um, so I'll be talking about the last two squares. Um, and then the last two squares, it shows, that it shows two scenarios. One is which the, um, tattoo needling device is not cleaned, so it's, it causes an infection. And then the second scenario is when it is cleaned with um, s uh, alcohol, and then so it does not um, cause infection, and that's a metaphor to the cleaning, clean room, which um, scientists use for research. Um, and then uh, when you go in, like you wear like um, suit jumpsuits from like the top, like top of your neck to the bottom, to keep out like um, prop, uh, like dust and other po pollution that um, that you don't want in the samples. Yeah. So I think a couple things that we'd like to point out really quickly on how this uh, artist may have improved their metaphor is that um, at least from what we could see in the middle two squares, it doesn't necessarily um, mention uh, how cost efficiency would be improved uh, when the waves were made smaller, as well as um, its ability to be uh, mass produced. Yeah, that's it. Do we have any questions? Well, I feel like this is this kind of is yeah. a top-down approach, is it not? Because he's putting on the stencil, and then he's inking on top of the stencil, and then he's like wiping away the stencil. So is that not a top-down approach, or? Um, I would say that that's still part of 
probably a little bit bottom up because it's still like adding something on as opposed to something where it like entirely entirely takes away um, as opposed to you know something that adds and then takes away a little bit. Usually top down means that you're just it's only reductive as opposed to additive and reductive. So is there any way that you could think of where you're making like <laughs> art on a body that's only reductive and not additive in any way? Like piercings? Like you just put like you're taking no. away parts of your skin? I don't know. Like yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. that's genius. Yeah. That <laughs> He's so smart. Yeah, or brand <laughs> branding. Some people are a little bit more oh. sensitive to that. <laughs> Not very common, but it does happen. Um, I have another question. So, um, so they did try to to show the clean room with the in, you know the inflection, and that's certainly you know one way of representing it. Um, another another thing too about the clean room is is not just that it can like destroy something because something is pretty big, but if you have dirt or dust and you're trying to um, to pattern, the pattern may not come out right, right? So yes. how could you possibly make that analogy um, fit into, or well, how can you make that idea fit into this analogy? So you're saying like uh, if it wasn't clean. Like, how could it change the overall finishing product of the tattoo? Mm -hmm. Maybe, like, if he's really dirty or, like, dusty. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, keep going. Sorry. when they do the process, the heating process, it might, like, leave out a few spaces and it would leave, like, a little marks of the whatever the resistant part that when he wipes it off comes off. way like maybe like if you had a lot of hair if you were a dude with a hairy arm and you had lots of hair on your arm then that might interfere with making the tattoo right so like possibly like removing that and making a clean a clean environment for the needle might be another way of, of depicting that or something like that yes possibly other questions Nice. <laughs> did, they, uh, did they miss anything that you wanted to, to ask? Um, no, not really. It's just the middle one on the top. So my idea was to make the three dots and put them together. Huh. But I guess he did not really interest. So, oh, that's right. This thing wasn't attached to me, actually. Okay. So what would what would shining the light in this case actually do? Like, what was the purpose of shining the light onto the, the arm and the stencil? Just to prevent the shadows that you see. Ah, okay. Is, was that meant to be representative of any of the actual experiment? Like, what, what is analogous to that in the actual thing? Gotcha. All right, cool. Well, if no more questions, then thank you. Cool. All right, team 10. Our second uh, supercapacitors team, Cade, Vaughn, and Ish. This is the on button for the laser pointer. Hello, I'm Cade Sarkin. I'm Vaughn Richard. I'm Anish Patel. And uh, we're going to be talking about supercapacitors again. So I'm going to be explaining the drawing first. So as you can see, there's three sources of fire, a lighter, a log, and a torch. And each of these has a symbol beside it. This one has a lightning bolt. This one has a snail. And this one has a balance in between the two. So the lightning bolt represents for the lighter that this is the quickest time to light. So it's the quickest power output. And then the snail for the log shows that this takes the longest time to light, so it's the slowest power output. And then the balance in between the two on the torch 
showed this takes time in between both of these, so it's a uh, medium power output between the two. And then also on the torch log and uh, lighter, there are timers on them, which these are representing the energy or time it takes for them to burn out. So the torch has the shortest time, or I mean the lighter has the shortest timer, so it has the least amount of energy su uh, supply. And then the log has the longest timer, so it has the most amount of energy supply. And the torch has the uh, middle one, so it's in between those two. And then on the bottom, you can see that there's the stencil, and it is actually being short, or the nozzle, but it's actually being shortened up from the lighter, so it's having less distance. And then gas is being added below it, so it's having more power supply or energy supply. And then that is making it have more surface area but less distance, giving it more power output and more energy. All right, I'm gonna be going over the experiment. But for that, I'll go over some background information. Uh, keyword is energy, and that's like the potential that a certain material has. And another one is power. That's how fast that the energy can be uh, moved through an object or material. So these three things represent three different uh, devices that we learned about. One of those is a capacitor, and it has uh, a lot of power, but not a lot of energy. That means it can really like flow energy through it, but it can't really store it. Uh, another one is the supercapacitor. It's sort of like a mix between the battery and the capacitor. Um, so it has like medium power and medium energy. Uh, and then there's the battery, and it has a lot of energy, but it can't really get that flowing fast. Uh, and the actual experiment that we did, so we made a super uh, super capacitor by um, taking these carbon like dough squares uh, and using citric acid as an electrolyte to uh, store current or yeah store energy and then discharge it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about like what each of these objects represent when we're talking about like the experiment. So first thing we have the lighter in the top left. So based on the timer, how it shows that it's the shortest amount of time that it can actually stay on. And based on the lightning bolt, we can see that this is actually the capacitor because it has the least amount, of, it has the least amount of power out of all of these. I mean, sorry, the most amount of power out of all of these, but it has the least amount of energy stored. Because when you're using a lighter, you can really quickly turn it on, but the flame doesn't really stay that long on when you have it on. And when you close it, you need to reignite it and recharge it, so, or so to say, kind of whenever you use it. Next, when we go on to the log, we see that it has the most amount of energy actually stored in it, but based on the snail, we see it takes the most amount of time and the effort to actually light. So we can see that that's basically the battery because the battery has a lot of energy, but the power output isn't as strong as, say, the lighter or the torch. And then the torch represents the supercapacitor because it's in the medium between the two, which shows that it has a medium amount of power and a medium amount of energy overall. And then when we go down to here, in relation to the experiment, we saw that when you decrease the amount of distance um, between the plates, how we did the experiment specifically, we had decreased the amount of space between the carbon, the various carbon um, clay, like dough material that we had. We de decreased that space by pushing down on them to ultimately increase the amount of energy that they could actually discharge. And ultimately this was seen when we would plug it into this circuit board that had a light and whenever we would actually turn on the super capacitor, the light would flicker on. The more we pushed down on it and the more the distance was actually decreased, the more the light actually showed up. And the another way that we actually made this capacitor a super capacitor was by increasing surface area, which is through this oil tank that um, was trying to show by the artist whoever made this picture. So when you increase the surface area, how we did that in the experiment is by flattening out these uh, the carbon um, clay uh, pieces. We flattened them out onto the uh, different steel plates and ultimately that allowed for more energy to be actually be used and uh, more discharge to see the light actually turn on. So, any questions? So the audience is also an expert in supercapacitors. <laughs> Parents, any questions about the experiment or the drawing? I can, uh, yes. Um, I think you're correct in your interpretation, but I'm interested in your thinking about the last picture at the very bottom. Um, so that seems to have a lot of power and a lot of energy. Uh, what source of, you know, what energy source do we have today that can provide a lot of power and a lot of energy? 
All right, so the question is, what energy source do we have today that can be, uh, provide a lot of power and a lot of energy? And the answer to that is uh, fossil fuels. And uh, we're trying to move away from those because those produce a lot of CO2, which can be harmful for the environment. So we're trying to move towards more uh, super capacitors. I think that it was believed to show uh, just an increase in service here, an increase in energy in general instead of fossil fuels. But it definitely seems like that's what is also putting it out there as that's uh, like that's where we get the most energy. Okay. Okay. So, um, so you saw how fossil fuels compared to capacitors, supercapacitors, and batteries, uh, based off of what chart that they showed you. Do you remember what it was? It was. Uh, Energy and power. Mm -hmm. Rones. You, do you remember the, the name of it by uh, chance? Like Rones or something like that? Close. The, it's close. It was the Rigoni plot. Rigoni. So, Rigoni yeah, plot. very close. Um, so, so, uh, so the uh, fossil fuels and combustion was on there. Another thing that was on there was, uh, was what? Do you remember? There was, uh, a, there was a fuel cell. A fuel cell as well. Um, so what are the, what's the difference between the fuel cell and uh, the fossil fuels and the battery, the capacitor, and the supercapacitor? In terms of energy and power? In terms of like what, what they are. I, th I think like batteries and capacitors and supercapacitors are all like forms of like storing energy, while fossil fuels is like you burn it and you really like release the energy and you just up obtain it and extract it from there. Good, exactly. So. So the other ones that you guys actually were comparing here are all energy storage, whereas fossil fuels and fuel cells, even though they are on the plot because they do produce energy, are actually generating the energy, not just storing it and then releasing it to you. Um, another question I have is, um, so you mentioned uh, reducing distance. So what exactly, you're reducing the distance between what and what exactly? Can you clarify that? In this drawing? Uh, no, in, in the actual experiment. Okay. Um, was it between? Yeah, like the different carbon um, like electrodes. And if there's a higher distance, there's more resistance, which means you get less volts. So. And then, well, so what's actually, so what is actually like moving then within your, or what, what is the thing that's actually kind of helping to charge and discharge? So you have the carbon, and then what else? The, the electrolyte. The, acid, electrolytes. the electrolyte, right? So, so it's also that distance that's, that's really critical. So it's not, so the, the carbon provides the high surface area, but the, the actual distance that's really important is the distance between the electrolyte and the carbon. So is there, is there a lot of distance between them? No. no not, not, not really, all. right? Whereas in a parallel plate capacitor, the distance is is what? Um, pretty we, big. Is the distance between? We put like the paper plates. towels and like other. And I'm not talking about no, the no, experiment. No. I just oh, mean okay. like in a, in a general yeah, parallel plate yeah. capacitor. What is what is the distance that we're? A lot bigger. The distance between the. the oh, the, the positive, positive and negative. The, the plates, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so in the case of a supercapacitor, the distance is is a lot smaller, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't have those two, the two plates. You're just, they're just like right next to each other. Any other questions? Can the uh, artist, artistic team behind this drawing, I think some of you guys at least are still here. I know one of your compatriots had to catch a flight, but um, uh, did, they, uh, did they miss anything that you guys were trying to portray? They got it all? Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you, guys. All right. Last but not least, our team of two today, Joseph and Cruz. Come on up. <laughs> Okay, for the final presentation of today, uh, 
and well, we'll be, uh, we have biotoxicity for the third time in a row. Uh, so biotoxicity is basically uh, uh, anything that's poisonous to cells and bacteria. Uh, in our case, we use uh, silver and testing against yeast. So uh, in the picture here, uh, the yeast is represented by our uh, terrarium greenhouse thing, and uh, the silver particles are represented by the bees, the hive, and the truck of bees. So why, so why silver is so reactive to, uh, so bad for cells is because uh, once cells interacts with the silver interacts with the cell, uh, it creates reactive oxygen species and lip and causes lipid peroxidation, which destroys the cell membrane and leaves you with a very dead cell. Now, uh, in our experiment, we messed with three different sizes of silver, and uh, each had different levels of toxicity towards the cell. Uh, yeah, would you like to explain? So, in our picture, our three different sizes are the bees individually, which represent the ions, and they can get in through the little door, but they can only like go in one at a time, and they're tiny, so they don't do a ton. Uh, you can, you've got the hive representing the nanoparticles, which can get in and release a ton of bees, uh, and they can pollinate everything. And you've got the truck, which is too big for the front door. So uh, in order to check how well the yeast cells were doing, uh, we would have a manometer which would detect how much uh, CO2 the yeast cells were producing. Uh, yeah, would you care to explain? All right. So in our uh, analogy here, instead of having the yeast cells being killed and then they produce less uh, CO2 because they're dead. Um, it's the inverse. And so when you have a bunch of bees uh, all pollinating in the uh, greenhouse, they produce lots of honey, and uh, our kid here is happy. Um, with the single bees, they produce less honey because there are less bees, and kids like mildly happy, I guess. And the bee truck can't get in, and so no honey was made. Uh, now, while well, we do like the picture and how it displays the uh, uh, the concept pretty clearly, uh, we think more should have been added. F for example, the um, it doesn't really show how the sizes of silver actually change in color due to uh, uh, plasmonics and stuff like that. All right. Um, so, um, th I think that this could have been, uh, put into the drawing, uh, via sound, or representation of sound. Uh, so, the ions, uh, in solution are so small that you just can't see them, and so this could be represented by the bees being so small that you can't hear them. And uh, the nanoparticles will um, change the color of the solution because uh, they absorb certain frequencies of light. And this could have been represented by the hive making a soft buzz uh, just to show that there was color there. And the bee truck uh, representing the a macro silver could just have an engine sound, a rumble or what have you, to uh, show that it can be seen. Uh, is that about it? Uh, any questions? Yes. So the question is, how could we change the depiction 
to make it not the inverse of uh, how it works in the yeast cells. And I think we'd have to like change the entire premise of the drawing. This is just the inverse. Uh, so I, mm, I don't know how you'd uh, do an inverse with bees. Is there like anything that the bees could hurt or destroy as opposed to flowers that they would pollinate? I mean, you could probably get the bees stinging animals inside the uh, greenhouse. Uh, but I'm not sure how you would uh, show the measuring of that. I don't know. Yeah, um, insects that eat the plants uh, rather than bees definitely could, and then you could, uh, I don't know, represent this with like crops and say uh, locusts or flies or whatever are coming in and then the uh, yield from the farm would go down as you got more of the insects coming in. I think that would work. Any other questions? Yes? Is there a picture uh, on the bottom right corner where there is no bees going in? Like the experiment, theoretically, what if, what if they have been quote unquote bees the whole time? Uh, yes, there would have been a few uh, going in, and uh, they would have released er, a few bees, but it is, um, as far as the uh, output is concerned, it would be pretty much negligible, uh, and I think that's what this was trying to show. Any more questions from the audience? Maybe one more audience question? Yes. Well, I guess there's two more audience questions, so we'll do your question first. Okay, so even though the ions are smaller than the nanoparticles, they get in through different methods. Like you can see um, here that the bees are getting through this little window and the hive is going through the chimney. Um, in the cells, the nanoparticles will get in through an active transport method uh, since the um, nanoparticles are both uh, neutrally charged and uh, about the same size as the food the cell eats, it will, since cells aren't very smart, uh, they will take in the uh, nanoparticle as if it was food and then the nanoparticle can do whatever. Um, but with the ions, they are positively charged and cells have gotten very good at dealing with uh, keeping out ions that are unwanted uh, using their charges, and that's why not many can get in. And then as a quick follow-up to that, so once the nanoparticles are actually inside the cell, why are they so good at releasing ions? Well, since they're nanoparticles, they have a really high surface area, and they can, uh, that allows a lot of the silver to uh, react with the oxygen in the cell and create those radical uh, oxygens that do the damage. Uh, and the silver ions individually can't do that because they're only one ion and it can only react once. Last question. Um, are there any acids that oxidize the nanoparticles? Yes, uh, they can be used since they kill cells uh, for disinfectant type um, you, things, and they won't be too terribly deadly to humans because we have so many cells in us that the you just need tons and tons of silver uh, to do damage, 
and you wouldn't do that with the disinfectants. And yeah. Um, I'll just make a quick addition or edit to, to that statement. So um, human cells actually don't tend to endocytose or eat nanoparticle cells in the same way that uh, bacterial cells do. So even if we had a lot of silver, it may not damage the same way because our cells likely don't uptake the, the silver nanoparticles in the same way. So first, uh, Cruz, I'm so sorry. Your <coughs> last name like autocorrected on my thing, so I'm sorry that your last name was spelled incorrectly. And then uh, secondly, will the artist of this drawing please stand up so we can acknowledge you? <laughs> is there uh, is there any uh, concept that you tried to get across that they didn't uh, they didn't capture? They got all of it. All right, nice. All right, good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so. Uh, hopefully, uh, students, you were all very proud of yourselves for the hard work that you did. And I hope that you all see both uh, the value in all of the science that you got to learn and the value of communicating it well. Because when you're actually, if you actually go on to be a scientist, um, you don't just have to talk to other scientists about your work that know the jargon and know all the technical talk. You have to talk to parents, friends, family, you have to talk to people in industry that might want to invest in your product that have no idea what nanotechnology is. You're going to have to talk to people in the government that decide whether or not science gets funded that also have no idea about science and definitely have ideas about whether or not things should be funded. So it is really, really important to develop the skill of science communication and being able to communicate to wide audiences. So you guys all did a very good job today. So I hope that you are all very happy. And parents and friends and students, please all give yourselves and each other a round of applause for a great job. <laughs> And with that, um, let's go out and enjoy a reception with some food and beverages. We, are, we already did one. <laughs>